Over on Purple Insider, a new Vikings history video is out about the time that Bud Grant, during a game against the Detroit Lions, only showed up to the game five minutes before kickoff. Click the card in the upper right corner to watch. And now, on with our feature presentation. March 5th, 1995. It's one of the biggest days in the history of the city of Springfield. I promise you I'm going somewhere with this, just bear with me for a minute. This was a monumental day, because it was the first ever Springfield Film Festival, where people from all over the city were trying to make films to appease the panel of critics and bring culture to the least cultured city in America. And while there were many films presented that night of the festival, varying in quality, and featuring the iconic film Man Getting Hit by Football, the highest budget film of the bunch, and the most anticipated on paper, was Mr. Burns' film, A Burns for All Seasons, directed by Steven Spielberg's non-Union Mexican equivalent, Senor Spielbergo. The film was a train wreck, featuring terrible acting and a nonsensical plot that was only designed to drive Mr. Burns' ego and try and boost his image. And afterwards, the people let him have it, booing him in this absolutely iconic scene. Smithies, are they booing me? Uh, no, they're saying boo urns, boo urns. Are you saying boo or boo urns? <laughs> obviously, what makes this joke work is that when people boo, it's very obvious. It's one of the only universal languages that applies to everyone regardless of where you are in the world. If there's something you don't like, you boo. And how you respond to the booing can be extremely telling of who you are as a person. You can ignore it and act like it's not happening. You can take the booing to heart, accept that those people have a right to boo, and try and do everything in your power to win the back over. You can criticize the people booing, saying they have no right to boo you, and that you try your best and you like to see them do it. There are many different options to responding to such harsh and loud and deafening criticism. However, you would think that no one would take the Smithers and Mr. Burns approach of acting like they weren't booing you, but rather were cheering you. They weren't booing you, they were saying boo earns. Or in the case of an NFL game, they weren't booing you. In fact, they were cheering you on. How dare you suggest that the fans were booing us? You don't understand. They were very clearly cheering us on, despite all the evidence to the contrary. And yet, as stupid as this might sound, the man that you've been watching this whole time? Well, this is Cleveland Browns head coach Sam Rutigliano. And following a 1982 game against the San Diego Chargers, with the players noticeably distraught about getting booed, with the team playing poorly, and with the media asking about the fans' reaction, Rutigliano decided to take one of the dumbest approaches imaginable that you're not going to believe. Heck, maybe even The Simpsons got the inspiration for the Bourne's joke from Rutigliano and his reaction. Because this is what has to be, considering the circumstances, the dumbest moment in the long coaching career of Sam Rutigliano. Before I talk about the comments made by Rutigliano that truly made no sense whatsoever and left everyone scratching their heads and incredibly confused, we need some context to understand what happened in the game that led to the booing. And before I go any further, I can already picture someone in the comments saying that this was not the stupidest and dumbest moment of Rutigliano's career. Rather, that was Red Right 88 in the playoffs against the Raiders. I already did an in defense sub episode on that, where I defended the decision wholeheartedly to throw the football there. So if you want to learn more about why I don't think that was a stupid play, you can do so by clicking the card in the upper right corner. This though? Yeah, there's no defending this. There's no defending what's about to happen here. With that in mind, it's December 5th, 1982. It's week 5 of the abbreviated 9 game season due to the strike, and we've got a battle on our hands over at Cleveland Municipal Stadium in the AFC between the Cleveland Browns and the San Diego Chargers. For the Browns, this is a big game, seeing as they sit at 2-2, two and, two, 
and right in the thick of things for a playoff spot in the eight-team AFC field. A win here, and they're sitting pretty at three and two, and pretty much just have to play 500 football the rest of the way to make the playoffs. A loss though, and they're two and three, out of the playoff picture, and have their work cut out for them the rest of the way, needing to either be near perfect to make it, or needing to get a ton of help. They don't have a lot of room for error after their poor showing the previous week on Thanksgiving in a loss to the Dallas Cowboys, in a game that you can learn more about by clicking the card in the upper right corner. Brian Seip, two years removed from being the MVP of the league, was struggling, which is three touchdowns and five interceptions, and the fans calling for his head. Cleveland, which was usually one of the better teams in the conference under Sam Rutigliano, was struggling and had a negative point differential. And Cleveland's run defense, ever since the strike ended, had been terrible, allowing an astonishingly poor 234 rushing yards per game. This game against the Chargers was a big one, because they needed to bounce back in the worst way possible. As for how the game turned out, well, based on what you can tell from these highlights, it did not work out for them. Not at all. Because when all was said and done, the San Diego Chargers not only emerged victorious, but did so in absolutely convincing fashion, taking it by a final score of 30-13 in a game that didn't even feel that close. San Diego held the lead the whole way through, including a 27-6 lead at the half. Once again, Cleveland's run defense was poor, as running back James Brooks picked up 96 rushing yards on 4.4 yards per carry and two touchdowns. Dan Fouts didn't have his best day at the office, and he made some mistakes, but he still completed over 78% of his passes, so outside of a few plays, the Browns really didn't have any answers for stopping arguably the best quarterback in football. Cleveland's offensive line completely fell apart in pass protection, allowing quarterback Brian Seip to get sacked four times, and take a few more hits alongside that. The Browns played extremely sloppy football, committing nine penalties, which is not going to win you a lot of games. Cleveland's defensive line could not get any pressure on Fouts, as he did not get sacked once. The Browns turned it over twice, and fell behind by so much so early on that Seip had to throw the ball 48 times which is never a good sign in early 80s NFL if your quarterback is throwing nearly 50 times. And the kicking game for the Browns was also atrocious, as kicker Matt Barr not only missed two field goals, but both field goals were extremely makeable and were not even close to hitting the mark. Basically, every problem that the Browns had all season was magnified by a thousand on this day as nothing about this game was particularly appealing or pleasing on the eye. Any hope that Browns fans had when the strike ended was all but gone by this point, and I'm sure quite a few Browns fans watching this game were hoping that the team would go back on strike, just so that they wouldn't have to watch this mess anymore. And seeing as the game was in Cleveland, the team was playing terribly, the team was making so many mistakes, and there was the general tension that fans had toward the players for striking and costing them two months of the football season, the fans voiced their displeasure like every other fan base in the world does. They threw beer bottles on the way- no, 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 I'm getting ahead of myself by about two decades. What I meant to say was that they booed. Every time the team made a mistake, they booed. Every time a player dropped a pass, of which there were quite a few on this day, they booed. Every time Matt Barr missed a field goal, or Brian Sight missed an open receiver, they booed. Every time the Chargers found the end zone, they booed. You get the idea. The Browns fans that spent their hard-earned money to watch their team play on a miserable day were not the slightest bit happy. And afterwards, head coach Sam Rutigliano noticed that his players were distraught about the fans booing them. Backup quarterback Paul McDonald who didn't even play in the game, commented on the booing, particularly the boos aimed at starting quarterback Brian Seip, by saying, The booing and chanting made me feel very uncomfortable. There are 11 men on the field, not just one. For 50,000 people or whatever, to boo a guy like Brian is wrong. 
Brian is a man who has done so much over the years to help give this town a good name. There is just no way the fans should get on him like that. Psych didn't let the booze get to him. Or if he did, he wasn't public about it. Said Psych after the game, Fans are very emotional. It doesn't surprise me that I'm getting booed. I haven't been giving them many good reasons not to boo me. I'm used to being under the gun. It goes with the territory. Both of those responses are perfectly acceptable. And naturally, head coach Sam Rutigliano was going to be asked about the Boo Birds. And there were many different ways that Rutigliano could have responded. He could have said something like, I didn't notice the booing. I was so focused on what was taking place on the field that I couldn't hear anything around me. Interesting response, but okay. He could have said, the vocal minority is louder than the silent majority. He could have said, fans have a right to boo. They pay good money to be here, and if we're not putting out a good product and living up to their expectations, I would boo too. He could have said, we can't have our fans booing us. We need their support. He could have said, any fan who dares to boo my players and boo this team should give their tickets to someone else, because we don't want them here. You could even make a joke and say that they weren't saying boo, but rather were saying rue, as in Rutigliano. Lay in the mood a bit. Basically, there were a bunch of different ways and a bunch of different reactions that Rutigliano could have given to respond to the boo birds each eliciting a different emotion. However, he decided to take another approach. He decided to take an approach with the media and his players that, quite frankly, I didn't know was possible. Because Sam Tigliano, for some reason, talked to the players and talked to the media, and said on the booze, the fans weren't booing us. They were cheering us. I'm not kidding. I'm not making that up. Sam Rutigliano flat out said that the fans were cheering the team on, despite every indication saying otherwise. They weren't saying boo, they were saying boo earns. Said Rutigliano, I don't know if you know anything about geese, but geese fly in a V formation. It has something to do with air pressure and aerodynamics, and they all have to pump the same way. If one doesn't, they all honk at the guy. And I think when the fans booed, they were all honking at us to get in that V formation. That's what I told our players. I think it's a great illustration of how people meet each other. The fans weren't upset with us. They were just honking their heads off, telling us to get in formation, telling us to win. That's right, folks. Browns fans weren't just fans of the Browns, but all the fans of the stadium are also master experts at bird flight and how geese work. And when they were chanting during the game, they were doing it to cheer the team on and encourage them. Almost like how geese honk. The fans weren't booing, they were honking with a purpose. The fans weren't disappointed or discouraged with us. They were merely encouraging us like geese do. I don't even know what to say to that. I'm flat out speechless. Of all the strategies to address the team and address the media about the booing, not just flat out denying that it ever happened, but saying that they were doing the opposite of booing is definitely not what I had on my list. Sam, you're a smart guy. You were a pretty good head coach. Heck, UPI named you coach of the year twice. What do you honestly believe is more likely? That the same fanbase that somehow spelled Dog Pound wrong all knows how geese operate and knows the hidden meaning behind what it means to boo someone, or that they were disgusted by the fact that your team was down by 21 points of the half and they were booing because they were angry with what they were seeing? And it would be one thing to mess with the media about this, almost as though this was sarcastic. If that was the case, and this was just a joke, then this is a non-story. But to tell the players after the game, who flat out commented on the booing, and knew exactly what the fans meant? To talk to the players and sugarcoat things like they're five years old? 
Come on. Either you genuinely thought this was a good idea, or you genuinely believed that the fans were cheering and not booing. And I'm honestly not sure which one is worse. Look, like I said before, Sam Brutigliano had his moments as a head coach. The Browns were terrible when he got there and were in disarray. And he pretty much immediately turned that team around. He was a master at second half adjustments, as shown throughout that entire 1980 cardiac season of theirs. And if their kicker, Don Cockroft, wasn't so terrible and hurt by the end of his career, he might have a Super Bowl ring under his belt. But this was not one of his finest moments. Not at all. Because after Sam Tigliano, for some reason, said that the fans weren't booing, but rather were cheering, a lot of people booed. Or cheered, depending on how you want to look at it. Get your official Jaguar Gear 9 merchandise by going to jj9shop.com and be sure to like and subscribe as it really helps the channel out a lot. Join me every Wednesday night where we'll play NFL trivia for cash prizes at 9 p.m. Eastern over on Twitch. To learn more about the history of college football, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 8. To learn more about the history of Major League Baseball, subscribe to Jaguar Gator 7. Also, special thanks to all of our Patreon supporters for helping out the channel. Your support is greatly appreciated. See how you can become a patron and request future video topics in the description below.